So uh, we'll look here at Google Analytics, which is one of the big, probably the biggest, most famous of these tools, the one that everyone wants to learn how to use. And honestly, it is complicated. There's just a lot of data that is collected here, way more than you would think. So you can, uh, if you've got it set up, you can log in, google.com slash analytics. I've already logged in and I'll show you what that looks like, but what Google Analytics is, is again, it's just another tool uh, that shows you the data of the traffic and such on your site. But because it is uh, connected to Google.com, the biggest search engine, it shows you even more detailed data, perhaps. Um, so Google.com slash analytics. Now, the confusing part is it was only uh, analytics for a long, long time. And then maybe one or two years ago, they started to add more things. So here from the Google Analytics homepage on the top right, sign in, it says, well, here's analytics, here's tag manager, here's optimize, here's data studio, surveys, attribution, audience center, and analytics 360. Sweet. So there's all of these extra um, features to gather our data. And the first one at the top is the one we mostly care about. And these other ones, like analytics suite, is a code word for not free. And the first one at the top, analytics, is the free one. So that is where you're going to click. After you sign in, um, you might get that view like that. So I got a pop up that said something about data retention. I believe I mentioned that last week that over in Europe there are um, big changes happening regarding privacy, online privacy that I think we're lacking or lagging in the US about. Apparently, May 25th is some sort of deadline in, in Europe where companies have to comply about how can they store your data and for how long. So I already closed it, but maybe I can make it pop up again over here. Let me just see if I can get it to pop up over here. Uh, there was a pop-up that said, oh, here it is. Uh, you are receiving this notification because you have not yet reviewed and saved your data retention settings. So because Google and these companies operate on the global scale, they have to follow the laws of every country, basically, and so it's complex. But over in Europe, they want to ha have this data not be stored forever, like it currently is. So here it says, how long would you like us to store this data? There's no minimum such as, you know, five days, 14 months and higher. Whatever you put there doesn't matter. It's just that this is just something that's happening with, uh, with the uh, privacy aspects of things. OK, so. At the top left, in my case, again, I work with different clients. So I have different groups organized, different clients. At the top here, I see all clients. And then I see all of these various clients being managed. In a particular client, which is an account, then there are properties. So one of the first things to know about Google Analytics is just its terminology. Accounts and properties. It makes more sense for someone like me that works with different clients. So I would say accounts, each client, property, each website of the client. For yourself, because you're doing this with your own business, you only have one account, your account of yourself. You may have more one or more properties. You may have more than one property. 
Uh, in this case, let's say again for myself, we have Gila truck, we have this one over here, we have this one over here. So let's say there's different clients. Then they have a property, and possible properties are like this. For this client, there is main website, there is YouTube channel, these are the various websites that I want to keep track of the websites that I want to keep track of for the client or for myself, obviously. Maybe what else? What else might I want to keep track of the data for besides the main website and YouTube? Maybe what else might you think? Maybe there's also social media. So these would be properties. There are properties attached to an account. You have many accounts. In my case, it makes sense here for you. It's going to be a lot simpler, probably, just your main account plus the one website, and that's it. But in this particular client, you see how it's set up. Show me the data of their main website. Show me the data of their YouTube. This one over here, just show me the data of their website. This one, their website. This one over here. Uh, show me this one, this one, and that one. Okay, so just to see how that looks, then I see uh, all website data, and I see in this way users, sessions, bounce rate, session duration, all of these I can go into detail and see more detail. Now this is pretty advanced in that it can tell me how many people are on the website right now. If, if you were to go to chilatruck.com, this would populate, and this is the traffic that you guys have been doing right now, going... If you were curious and went to that client's website and looked at it within the last, whatever this is, 10, 15 minutes, it showed here. People had visited the site in the last 15 minutes, whatever that time period is. So how do you acquire users, traffic channels, uh, organic, social, direct, referral, other? How are your active users trending over time? How well do you retain users? So you see all of this data, it's even going to tell you what popular countries and devices and time of day, when are people visiting most often. So, so much data. Uh, people are not visiting the site earlier than 6 in the morning, really. Someone that has the, the munchies at 1 in the morning, sure. But then after that, it's mostly toward the day. And some of the peak times visiting the website are somewhere around 9 o'clock on a Monday. So a lot of detailed breakdown there. In this particular client, the most popular way to visit the site is on a desktop computer. Second is mobile, decreasing. Third is tablets. What are the pages that people visit most often? The history has more hits than the home page. So that's showing people are searching keywords and such about history of chilaquiles, or where did chilaquiles come from? And that particular page is capturing more traffic than the home page. OK, well, I know that this page is more popular than these others. Well, who cares? Do you have an idea maybe why that would matter? How can I take advantage of that? Here's a, here's, some, uh, here's a tactic. If you determine a page that is getting a lot of traffic that you didn't expect, you can add content to that page that people might react to. 
if I know that a lot of people are, are coming, if more people are coming to the history page than the home page, and ultimately I'm maybe trying to make sales, or maybe I'm trying to, get, uh, one of the purposes of the site maybe is to uh, book catering jobs. What if, if when people come to that history page, I also mention in different ways that this client does catering. If I'm getting traffic to that page, people are seeing that page, I want to let people know we do catering. So example, add sale or coupon or some sort of, you know, um, deal content to that page. After reading that about, after reading that history page, then the last paragraph mentions something like, uh, and don't forget to, when you book us for your next catering job, don't forget to mention the coupon code 25 number, uh, you know, Chila Kila 25, and you get 25% off your next purchase from the people that are coming to that page. On that page. On that page. Yeah. Question? What's the history page? Okay. What's, what's a history page? What, what do you mean? Um, using the history page gets more advanced history tradition. I don't even see it on anywhere in my home page. Yeah. It is uh, actually a blog post. So it's in the blog post, one of the blog articles. Yeah, right there, history. It's, it's a blog article. So the blog post gets more traffic uh, than the other ones. Question? Can I show you something? There's a Okay. Question. But that's also telling me that the history and the tradition and where this comes from it is what people are searching for, which is to it. So you can, you can create a, a lot of section and you can play on the history and the evolution and, and then you can go over here with the real stuff that comes from the blog post. But that's telling me that it's the blog post that he's not getting. Yeah. That's one of the big things about all of this, that it is timely content that gets updated more compared to stuff that stays there all the time. Uh, guys, uh, a little distracting here. So, so it is more about how it is that blog posts are really one of the big things about SEO because you can create those and populate them and change those much more organically than I'm going to force keywords into my about page. I'm going to force keywords into the contact page. Blogs where you can write 100 words or 75 words or 300 words, that's the content that you can put out a lot faster perhaps to capture the traffic. all the various ways that you could possibly misspell Chilaquiles, would that still make it to that site? You, meaning, would you use those on your site? Yeah, like, so if I'm typing it, I'm like, oh, Chilaquiles sound good. How do you spell it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you're doing Chile, C-H-I-L-E. Would I-L-E bring up that, you know, get you close to them? Because if I don't know how to spell Chilaquiles, mm -hmm. Chilaquiles, I would think it was with an E. Or mm -hmm. there's a couple of more L's in there. Or, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, um, based on what the data is showing me, if that is common, this is a this is a hard word. This is an uncommon word for many people. So it might benefit me to take advantage of those misspellings uh, in a in in the site. Uh, you're not going to see it on on every kind of site where there's common misspellings, and it might not be relevant. It depends on the site, but for for this. It may be useful to think about using those misspellings also, like a page, a blog post about in the history, but then also different spellings, maybe. Because some of those misspellings might be alternate spellings that used to exist. Well, you know, I would imagine that a food truck is such an impulse buy anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not getting their business from their website. They're getting their business from drive-by. People see it, people talk about it. Well, also, if they are a food truck, they may appear in the same location on a regular basis, or they may travel because they're mobile. So one purpose of the website as well is to keep you up to date about where this food truck is at the moment. And that was my next question. Why wouldn't that be the home page? 
Uh, there, there was a, on the homepage. There is that information. Oh, it's, but it's written. I mean, uh, I think like if I'm on my phone and I want to show the human, that like a map immediately, like what's close to me. Yes, there, there's still things that could be done for this one for this client to further optimize, but as mm -hmm. often is the case, there's budgets. So. Uh, uh, without divulging at all, there there is, you know, still work to be done on this site. Uh, so that's right. Your from your perspective, you would like to see a map. Like, well, I don't know, I don't know the Chula Vista area. Where is the Chula Vista shopping center? It would be nice for a map, or other features here and there. The blog hasn't been updated in a little while, also. So there's still things that could be further refined on the on the site. So, blogging is very important nowadays because it's a place on your site where you can <coughs> create content based on keywords. Writing articles of 100, 300, 500 words or more on a regular basis, once per month, week, day, whatever. Uh, writing articles of some length on some regular basis is the tactic uh, to, or one of the tactics, to help your rankings. The search engines value content that is timely and what people are searching for and, and uh, relevant. Uh, sometimes people learn this SEO stuff and apply it to their site and then expect that it'll work for them for the next five years. Well, the search engines change, the algorithm changes because the spammers abuse the techniques, the, the tactics, and so the search engines have to change themselves to fight the spammers. And one of these things is that stagnant content doesn't help you. Uh, your, your website might have existed for five years compared to your competitor, but you haven't updated it in four. Your competitor is new this year but they're updating and they're writing a new blog every month and they're using keywords in their articles and such so you should too the age of your site is valuable but also how recent how current it is is valuable the keywords are valuable let's see what else here um, Yes. Um, what does it mean by page value? I mean, you don't have a value there, but is that something Google rents dollars? Well, this is yes, but this is related to the PPC, the pay per click. Oh, okay. So when you want to uh, promote a certain page, at the moment it's 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 very low, so that's good and bad. It's good in that then it's very affordable for me to start to do PPC to get traffic, as I get traffic and visibility and all of that, then these values will increase and then you'll have to pay a little bit more to have keep to keep it going. Yeah. Can you um, just talk about how to um, eliminate the, the ISPs that are part of the company, you know, so that they're not included in the search? It's a little bit of a, of a technical thing. Off the top of my head, I, f I forgot how to do it because it is a little technical, but somewhere here under, where do they do it? It, it, is, in a, it is a bit in a, of, an, in of an advanced place. Somewhere under admin, create view, filter, somewhere around there, there's a way for you to filter out traffic that you don't care about yeah. that will skew your results. Yeah, I think I stumbled on it at some point, but I was just wondering, like, in, in the case of, you know, I have a client who's in Tijuana, but she also 
you know, lives in Chula Vista. So it's not like just one office where it could just be, what's my ISP? Mm -hmm. You know, there's mul and there's multiple people do it. Do I basically need to send an email to every single person in that her company and say, kind of walk them through? Because you have to go online and say, you know, you Google what's my ISP and then they send that to you. And I, then I would have to put that here. Possibly, but let's back back up a moment. So you want to filter out ISPs, but in what way, in your opinion? Well, I just and that was, I guess, kind of my question. It's like I just don't want any numbers coming through from you know the staff that are going onto her website. Or yes, and they're, and, the, they're, and they're in multiple places. So yeah, so yeah, you would have to do that. You would have to know what is the service provider of those various people visiting the site and you would have to get that information from somewhere from each one and somewhere here it might be here in the filters uh, there's going to be a place for you and you would have to put those in manually and say uh, omit this traffic from these ISPs. So just playing on that so I kind of understand so I figured that's kind of what I had to do but if there, what about on phones and stuff? You know, like how, does, does at a certain have, point, you have to determine the cost, the cost of that effort. Is it going to be uh, very helpful for me to remove all of the traffic from the from the staff? I think at a certain point, it doesn't it doesn't matter if if their own staff visits ten times a day, because then that's going to be. A small amount of traffic compared to hopefully the dozens or hundreds of bits of traffic you're getting from real places. So once you kind of gather in general, what are the ISPs? And with mobile, you're you're not going to be able to do that very well yeah, at I all. Didn't know that you that applied, so that's where I yeah, because mobile is is also pretty large, and like you know, you're going to have Telcel, and then I don't want to block out the t traffic from Telcel. That's like half of Tijuana using it, so. Right. Uh, I wouldn't go that far to try to. It's you. Those filters are usually used much more in terms of like uh, filtering out traffic, like from your own from your own office location. Right. Yeah, like when I was at UCSD, we just you know blanketed out UCSD people, and mm -hmm. that was kind of easy, you know. Because it was the one location. Yeah, like, yeah. So then, when you're dealing with uh, blanking out traffic from people's houses and all of that, it's like I wouldn't even bother with that. I don't think it's going to skew your data so much that it will hurt you, but okay. you'll have to do a little bit of legwork to get the names of those ISPs and set up the filters and all that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at some cool data over here. Um, okay, so under home, I get a big sense of general ideas of traffic and such. Then uh, I get it break broken down much more here. I have audience, acquisition, behavior, conversions. So you can set conversion goals here uh, about, uh, well, we'll get to it in a moment, but let's look at each of these. So if I look under audience, this breaks down into overview and then very detailed details. So if I look at audience overview, within this time period of one month, and again, the longer you have this set up, the longer you can set it up here to show you the data, within this time period of a month, it says 108 users, 105 new users, 130 sessions. Now they had, do they still have it? Oh yeah, there it is. So if you if you simply hover over the name of that element, it'll give you a quick definition of what that is. Users who have initiated at least one session during the date versus new users, number of first time users during the selected date range. So this can keep track of who has visited your site for the first time and who has visited multiple times. Those are those cookies that we hear about that they're tracking us. Yes, but now you're doing it too and you're seeing hopefully the value of it. I want to know this data. I'm going to use it obviously for good purposes, but obviously this can get corrupted into many other purposes with annoying ads and all of that. But for us here, we're keeping track of people coming. Um, how many pages did a person look at when they were on the site? 1.3. How long were they on the site? 38 seconds. Bounce rate. So if you hover over these, they give you a little definition. And to tell you what's good and what's bad, I can't exactly tell you what's a good number, what's a bad number. 
I can only tell you in terms of relative to your business or your industry. So let's say, for example, here, uh, session duration. How long does a person stay on your site? So it can track that much. How long does a person stay on the site? So uh, 38 seconds. If I'm visiting the website of a restaurant, yes, I've got articles about the history of Chilaquiles and all of that. But maybe after you look at some of those great pictures and start your mouth starts watering, I want to know where are they at. So once I find that out, the location or the phone number, then I don't really need the site anymore. So a, a, a low number, perhaps, is not bad if the person is able to get the information that they need within that time period. If from a restaurant's website, you're not going to hang around there that much. You want the relevant contact info. Are they open? Do they cater? and such. And then I'll call them to do catering. Let's say I'm an author or an artist. I want people to read my articles. I'm a blogger. I write about finance, let's say. That's a complicated topic. I want people to read the articles. It should not be taking 38 seconds to read those articles on finance. So for that client, 38 seconds might be a, a very short amount of time people spend on the site. For other clients, a 38 seconds might be just enough. So there's no right or wrong answer. How long are they on the site? Bounce rate is related to that. The percentage of single page sessions in which there is no interaction with the page. Um, that means any page that they went to and then left. So what if they found that page of history, they read that page, and then they left. They didn't buy anything. They didn't hire for catering or anything. That's bounce rate. They visit one page, any page, and then they leave. For some clients, this value might be very bad. For some clients, it may be OK. For some, good. This client, a person visits any page, and it can tell us which pages later. You visit a page, you get what you need, you leave. That's fine. They bought the product, they called, whatever. Again, the author. Uh, they've only read one of my articles. They weren't, the others weren't interesting enough for people to come back and read more. So that's the thing there about uh, is it a good value or not. Languages. So this will tell you down here in terms of uh, what is the language of the person visiting your site. Well, how does it know what language I speak? Our web browsers are set to a language on our computer. So all of this information is broadcast automatically when we visit websites. And unless you're in private mode and you have security features and such, all of this information, we're giving it away for free to anyone that knows how to use it. And so that sounds scary on one aspect, but it's great for us as a business on another aspect. Because if I'm determining the different languages that are coming to my site, well, I need to then focus perhaps on a certain language or put more promotion in, in that language. English US is the number one language people visit here. Uh, ES, which is what do you think? Espanol. So, so Spanish, Espanol. Uh, I have to look up what XL means, but ES, 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 US, what's the difference? Spanish from Spain. Spanish from Spain and Spanish from the U.S. Yeah. FR, FR, French from France. Well, what else is there? Canadian. Canadian French, French from Canada, FRCA. And yeah, other countries as well, uh, Haiti and such, and I, I think, right? So, um, different languages. Yeah. Well, what is ZHCN? ZH, I believe, is a, a, a variation of Chinese. So this tells us that full report. OK, country, the most popular uh, places people are coming from. US, Mexico, that makes sense. Peru, that makes sense. That's Spanish. Philippines, uh, close. They were a, uh, a, a Spanish colony for a while, right? Now, then unfortunately, we are then going to see the traffic, unfortunately, from China, India, Russia, that is just going to be spam, because there's so many spam farms in those countries, and 
a lot of times these are going to be completely discounted just because um, there's a lot of spam coming from those places. Yes? Um, if you found that you had a like, non-spam from a certain region outside of the U.S., would you have to, how would you, you would have to do another website within that language, would you not, or how would that, how yeah. would you hybridize that? You can do it a variety of ways. You could have, uh, this is a WordPress website, and it could be set up in a way that has a plugin that translates the site. Uh, or it could have, for example, up on the address, it could have, you know, um, ES dot, she looks like the Spanish version, or, you know, MX dot. Then it would be different versions of the site. It'd be two sites you'd have to manage. Right. Most times, what people would do is a translation plugin, which are not perfect because it's a machine trying to translate, which never works with slang and such. And so, uh, to capitalize on that, if I do see a lot of traffic from different languages, different countries, I would want to perhaps maybe not create a whole new page, a whole new site completely mirrored in another language, I could create one page that's in that language and try to capture traffic from that language, that country on that page and have certain deals and language and, and verbiage there. Okay, cities. Now this data, some of it is easy to capitalize on and some of it is harder to capitalize on. Here in cities, it's showing that the majority of traffic to the website coming from a Google search um, is uh, San Diego, then Los Angeles, then Not Set, then Chula Vista. So Chula Vista is technically where it's at, the Chula Vista Mall, but it gets more traffic from the general area of San Diego. Not Set is when people go into uh, private browsing mode. When they go to their browser's mode where it turns on tracking protection and it doesn't save cookies and, and, and all of that. So that's third place right there. 8% of people to this site are visiting the site or browsing the web in general in those private modes. And there's nothing we could do about that. People are, are hopefully becoming more aware of privacy and such online, and they take those actions to protect themselves. Well, the point of this is, this is showing us data of where people are coming from, and all of this is California traffic. There's, there's no traffic coming from like Tijuana. But the point of this is, uh, on my website, if I have the know-how, or if I have the software, or if I have the people that can do this, I can have the website detect someone is coming from a, the area of Los Angeles. And then a pop-up could happen on the website that says, welcome. Los Angeles Traveler, today only 10% off if you use this code. So all of this data that we get from here, what operating system and such, all of that with the right technical know-how, then you could capitalize it on your website. You could use that on uh, Google AdSense and such and create ads in Facebook that will target Spanish speakers in Los Angeles that looked at a certain keyword. That's the point of all of this data not to scare you about how much it knows about you, but to help you make those decisions. So example. You know uh, your top city and language from Webmaster Tools. So you create Facebook ads that target that city and language, the demographic you know your top city and language from your webmaster tools and landing page. Uh, quick definition, landing page, any page uh, where you can direct traffic to. So you create a Facebook ad <coughs> to that demographic and add a link to a landing page. That landing page 
to be set up for maximum result. And that varies for everyone. I, I can't tell you what your maximum result is. But it could be a coupon. It could be the newsletter sign up. It could be a product. It could be a blog post. Whatever you're trying to get out of it. A sale. Buy now. Mm -hmm. So your landing page can be any of your pages that you're trying to set up to, like if you're doing a, uh, uh, let's see, a uh, price thing that they're filling up the form? It, uh, there's a couple definitions for it. Commonly, it is, uh, for example, having uh, the name of the website slash uh, weekend-deal.html. It could be a specific page crafted only for a certain topic that you don't get to from the main menus. Okay. That's often the best way to determine how, how well your landing page or your marketing... I mean, I feel like if you do a special or something or any type of thing that they click onto it, that's where you can get your analytics from. Well, it's going to give you the analytics of that particular campaign that you engaged in and keywords and such. Uh, but just backing up to what is a landing page, it could be a page the, where the only way to get to it is through a special secret esoteric link. But you could have the general definition of contact. I'm using it as a landing page. I'm going to direct people to the contact page in this tweet or in this Facebook post. That's where I want them to land on. And it is on the menu. Anyone can get there. Yeah. So that's a, a, that's a legitimate uh, landing page or you know, a carefully crafted page deal of the day. Deal of the day or for that particular page. Mm -hmm. right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. You would create that page, just not include it in the menu. Pretty much. You create a page and you don't put it in the menu. Yep, pretty much. But then the only way to direct traffic to it is you have to then go out and bring the traffic in from Twitter or Facebook or Google, AdWords or Bing or whatever. So. I wouldn't quite say incentivize, but. The point of it is, uh, let's see, a real-world example. Uh, it's the difference between putting a billboard for your business out on Main Street where everyone will see it, as opposed to putting a flyer for your business in a certain magazine. Only that audience that reads that magazine will see that ad, as opposed to putting the same ad up on a billboard where everyone can see it. I would put that magazine. I would put that ad in a trade journal as opposed to on the sidewalk where everyone will see it and no one will care. Let's see what else can we see here. Okay, so Chrome is the most popular web browser. People use that one. Second is Safari. Then we've got um, people on an Android device, Edge, Microsoft, Safari in the in app. That usually comes from like if it's in Facebook and someone clicks on Facebook and it goes, I mean from Facebook people click on the company, it goes to the website, it's the Safari in the browser. Firefox, sixth place. And here's an interesting story uh, over an operating system. Okay, seems that the most popular operating system, which is a little contradictory maybe, the most popular operating system people are visiting the website in iOS, which is an iPhone or an iPad and such. So it seems that more people visit that client on an iPhone, let's just say, um, than, than on Windows, than on Android or a Mac. Well, here's something that I heard about a few years ago. There was some sort of, like, uh, uh, bed and breakfast company or travel company or something that it was discovered that their prices were higher for people that were visiting on a Mac compared to those visiting on a Windows computer 
because they figured if you're going to buy a $999 laptop as okay. opposed to a $499 laptop, right? Mac laptops often start at $899, $999, $799. If you can afford one of those pricey Mac laptops, you can afford to buy a more expensive version of our product as opposed to buying a $499, $399 Windows machine from Walmart. So they got caught. They figured that out. Like, oh, I'm visiting your site on a Mac and my price is higher than on Windows what's going on and then they say oh well you know that was a, that was our mistake that was a problem in the coding we'll fix it they got they got caught about it but they were obviously doing it they were looking at their Google Analytics or some sort of data and determining well for this demographic we'll charge this and this demographic will charge that and it worked for them until they got caught okay less nefarious I determine that people visiting on the Mac are visiting and I make a pop-up that happens saying hello Mac user hello Mac fan here's a coupon for you if you use it in the next 10 minutes and uh, someone visiting on uh, on Windows I could have a different content that's not as bad as jacking up the prices but there it is just doing it in a different way I'm gonna jump over here to acquisition Acquisition is where you acquire your traffic from. Acquisition overview. So here's what we what I've got in this example. Uh, there's this pie, and you may have a couple more options depending if you also do, for example, uh, email newsletters, uh, organic search here in blue. So the traffic that comes to this website mostly comes from someone doing a search, an organic search, meaning the client did not pay to buy keywords. People search for history of chilaquiles. That was an organic search. They clicked, they went to the client. 60% of the traffic goes to the site that way. 20% goes to the site via social media. <coughs> the activity that happens on Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and all of that. Direct is 15%. That is when someone types directly the address in their computer or browser, chilatruck.com. They type an exact address or they type chilatruck.com slash blog. That is direct traffic to the website. That's often uh, a little lower because un unless you have that particular link bookmarked in your browser or you know the address and you type it, you're often going to get to there through a search. This last little one right here is referral. Can't quite select it, but it's right there. Referral is if you're getting traffic from some other site. Another site is referring uh, the, browser, the user to your site. That often comes from like uh, review sites and testimonials and blogs and such. So to put it in the notes, acquisition channels. Organic, social, direct, referral, paid is not here, and also email. Traffic from a non paid Google search. Social from any social network. Direct traffic from uh, typing the address to a page or a bookmark. Referral traffic from a blog review site from somewhere else. Yelp, uh, I, I think uh, I'm not quite sure. It could be either social or referral, but these are more commonly from, you know, some sort of food blogger or reviewer site and that sort of thing. You can't make a coupon on a Yelp. They click on the reviews. Can you? Um. Yeah, because they to serve the traffic back to the site. Since they're doing reviews of it, then it gives you that attention, and then you can make it some kind of ad or pop-up. Or... Well, that's someone else wrote the review, and then they follow that link to come back to the 
to the site. And here it can tell us from where. So we could we could set up some sort of way to capture the traffic from that review. It just reminds me of like the Rotten Tomatoes where the movie people are getting pissed off with that agitator and that's what my, Yelp reminds me of. Hmm. I see that you can't really go to Yelp if you can see the review about it and how do you start the analytics from that Yelp? Well, Yelp will give you analytics. Once you set yourself up in Yelp, it will tell you various uh, analytics. And you can put some things in your Yelp account to also help you get results. That one, however, you quickly go into the aspect of it that you're going to pay Yelp a variety of, for a variety of services. So there is a way if you're back on the Yelp site. Question? Yes, uh, I believe it does count. It wouldn't count your own site's blog. That would be like a circular kind of link. It wouldn't quite count that. It would be uh, someone else's site coming back to your site. Paid, obviously, is PPC, so paying for keywords and such. And email is newsletters. So breaking down the data here, yes? It would be here, but this client is not engaging in PPC, so it doesn't show up in the pie chart or the email. So I could then further break down down here. I can click on, OK, what are people searching for? Where is the social network coming from? What are these referrals? Uh, let's see if I can set this for a longer time period, just so that we might get more data. Well, with such a large portion as an organic search, would not make sense of uh, the blog page being the biggest hit. Let's let's see. So I set this for now for a for a year of data, and after a year of data, notice how the pie chart has changed. The um, social has increased. It was twenty percent in the last month. It was 28, 29 percent in the last year. Uh, oh, not sorry, not social, direct. Social still increased and even referral. So uh, you could go here and see what actually is. Um, the, the details of the data. Facebook traffic, Twitter, Yelp, Instagram. So 40% uh, of the traffic came from Facebook. And then we can see here bounce rate. When people come from Yelp, they leave the fastest. Or actually from Instagram. When they come from Instagram, they leave the fastest. They stay the, the longest on Twitter. Um, not the longest, but they, they look at other pages before they leave. Over here, see, so they look at two, at least two different pages on Twitter, but from these other networks, the, the smallest one, Instagram, and also time period, pretty short over here. So that's the whole point of something like Google Analytics, you get all of this, all of this data. Lastly, and then we're going to wind down in a moment, behavior. This will then show you what are, what are the actual pages and such. Uh, so in the whole length of time of a year, the home page and the menu screen, those are the ones that get the most traffic. But apparently in the last 30 days or so, it was the history that was getting this traffic. What are the terms that people were using and everything. So the longer you have this set up, the better, because it will then uh, give you more data. Yeah. Can you set this up too soon? And the reason I ask that question is that. We talked about the history and the, the, the duration of the page. So 
even though I'm about probably a good nine months out of start and then go in and set my site up so that it starts to accumulate history. But if I set this up at the same time and there's no activity, is that going to have an adverse effect? Or it just has no effect at all? It's just sitting there. And it's, no it's just sitting there. It's it's gathering data. Um, you may discover stuff that you didn't think about. So I, I would still set it up early on. You you will you will you shouldn't be surprised that you will get spam traffic early on because uh, the spam sites and the spam bots are just bouncing from site to site. You might get traffic that doesn't matter at the moment, but who knows? It doesn't hurt just to set it up and then look at it once in a while and see see the data. And would you put some sort of a, I've always been heard it called a parked page, something, just something there so that there's a visual an under construction page or just whatever? Yeah, I would do an under constructed page. Uh, if it's completely empty, uh, it doesn't inspire good confidence. Will they ever come up? Did they get shut down? What happened? I would put a an under construction landing page to kind of tell people we're coming soon or what do you expect to find here. Uh, it doesn't hurt to then, you know, put a graphic and a little text about your keywords and such and just gather some data until you're ready to launch in nine months. And again, that's just something I do with my hosting service and kind Yes. Yep, upload it directly to your provider. All right, uh, final questions for the day, and we'll have a little lab time. Any any questions on things we talked about today? Right now, it's giving me the data uh, of everyone that's visited the site. If I add segments, these are the demographics. Uh, these are, I can break it down, only show me traffic from mobile, and only from this and that, and so I can break it down into the segments of the data. Yeah. Can you show the keywords part? Uh, this one? Keywords. Uh, do you have a specific page? Which page do you mean? Yeah, what are the keywords that search uh, on Google or the other search engines for this web page? Where can we see? Are we the need to use AdWords or another tool? AdWords, yes, would be the the tool to use on Google. Google AdWords is the one related to uh, the keywords and the pay-per-click and the research to figure out the keywords for using Google. We saw it in Bing that it was directly all of it. The thing I liked about Bing was that it's all together in one place. Okay. This one is in, you do one thing in one screen, you do another thing in another. It's kind of a little bit of everything everywhere, but it's AdSense for the keywords. Okay. I just try to find, but I yeah, <laughs> find it exactly. So they have it separate over on the uh, okay. mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah, as a practical matter, I mean, I'm running a business, and this is this is a full time job. Yes. Right? Um, how often? Would you, I mean, it's important to know this and understand it to communicate with someone like yourself. How, how often would you suggest we're going to go into manage this and try to? It's it's perfectly fine to do this like once a month. Uh, so, uh, more often than that, might not give you a lot of useful information, and longer than that might be too long to do anything about it. If I determine in useful information, but I'm only looking at it every three months, every quarter, or something, well, I missed an opportunity to do something. So once a month is a very good goal to look at this. And you could try a little sooner than that, especially when you first set it up and you're learning it more and you're visiting it every other day or something just to learn every screen and nuance. But you're not going to get a huge influx of changes unless you are actively engaging in pay-per-click or a lot of social media. Then you can break this down to show me the data of the last seven days or the last two days. Right? Show me the data of the last three days. And unless you are doing tactics to, to do that, you're going to get nothing. Because 
I'm not engaging in it. Yes. Um, I have one page that happens to be the second highest mm -hmm. page views, and it's just doesn't. It's just a slash. It doesn't have anything after that. Um, to, I, I want to ask. It's not, if it's just it, if it's just a regular, maybe I can find one here. But if it's just a slash, that means the home page. That, oh, it doesn't say, even though my yeah. my title says home, it, that just means it's the home page. It's just the home page. A regular old slash. Basically, is you know the yeah. technically, if you have it like Google.com slash, yeah. well, that that final slash right there it means the home page. Oh, okay, I just wanted to kind of make sure of that. Yeah. Um, this may be a little bit too technical, but um, I think a restaurant where my work is showing. They want a site where we can do a special event and they can do an online auction while pieces are being auction that night for a specific event. Mm. How challenging is that to build into a site? I have to think about it at the moment. Uh, I, I have to think about a, a deeper answer. It is a deeper answer that I can quite give. Let's end the lecture at this point and maybe talk a little bit about it. Okay. So I'm going to put the notes that I've been writing uh, into the network folder and Again, as usual, 